Hope you're all awake this morning. Um, I, I, I appreciate your, your patience and bearing with us. I, I really believe that one of the quickest ways that Satan can get into a church on Sunday morning is through the technology. And uh, so thank you for being with us. We've got an awesome tech team. Let's give them a hand. Um, they don't only put in time getting here early on Sunday mornings, but they put in time throughout the week. Uh, we've made some upgrades. We got, we've upgraded our camera system because our online presence is growing. And uh, so they, they were installing that this week and learning that. And so, so thank you guys once again for that. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's, like I said, growth is good. Lots of stuff happening. But I want to stop for a second. I want to pray because we've had a great morning of celebration, a great time of, of God doing great things. And when that happens... That's when the enemy comes at you the hardest. And this past week, our faith family here has undergone a lot. There's been health issues, relationship issues, job issues, loss of loved ones and close friends. It seems like it's all coming down. But I want to tell you, and I want to stop and I want to pray for that. I want to pray for our family for that, but I'm going to tell you this. As I've heard over and over this week, more stories of pain and heartache, it has just reminded me that as we've gone through this, this series on boldness, I have seen people in this church begin to live their life boldly in ways that I never thought imaginable. And I think in their minds and in their hearts, and they've told me this, I can't believe I prayed this prayer. I can't believe I had this conversation with so-and-so. God is moving in the hearts of our people. And that's a celebration. But that also means that the enemy, as Peter says, Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And so when we grow closer to God and we begin to serve God, and, and today we're going to look at what it means to be obedient, boldly obedient to God and where that can go. When we do that, the enemy goes on attack. And so I want to stop and I want to pray a prayer of protection over our church right now. So would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, you are doing some awesome, awesome things. We celebrated that this morning and we're going to continue to celebrate that. And I pray that you continue to bring more and more people to you so that we can celebrate and show the world that you are alive and you are breathing life into this community. But Father, with that comes pain, with that comes heartache, with that comes attacks from the enemy, a spiritual warfare is very, very real. And as we're going to look in scripture this morning, we see that. And I just pray a prayer of protection over our church, over our people, over our leaderships. I pray for protection of me, Lord that you would allow us to continue to grow closer to you, that our lives would become bolder and bolder, and if so, more obnoxious for you. And I just pray that you would protect us in that so that in our lives, we can glorify you, we can bring honor to you, and we can make your name known. So Father, this morning, as we look at what it means to be obedient to be boldly obedient, I pray that you would continue to rise up a movement where we jump in, all in, for you to live our lives boldly. It's your name we pray. Amen. So as part of the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12 says this. It says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And we've mentioned many times this morning that today is Mother's Day, and we celebrate Mother's Day. And my mom is watching right now, so happy Mother's Day, Mom. Um, she was here last week. She's back home, but she watches every week. Um, and uh, uh, so happy Mother's Day. So when we celebrate Mother's Day, oftentimes it's, it's to the woman that gave birth to us. But for many of us, we might not have a close relationship with the, the, the woman who gave birth to us, but we have mother-like figures in our lives from various points that have come alongside us and they've given us wisdom. They've given us comfort. They've provided for us. They've cooked really good meals for us. 
And in that, we want to celebrate them on Mother's Day as well. And part of celebrating them is to live out what Exodus 20, 12 says here. To honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And part of honoring your mother is through the act of obedience. Look at how this commandment, this, this commandment in the Ten Commandments, is rephrased in Ephesians 6, 1 and 2. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Talking about obedience. And so as we celebrate Mother's Day and Father's Day, we'll celebrate in a few weeks. We're honoring those parents, those guardians, those people who have been motherly and fatherly influences on us. And this morning, we saw a whole bunch of families up here to make a commitment to be parents who are going to strive to raise their children in a godly Christian home. And I find it humorous. Last night I was hanging out with my family and some friends, and and we were joking about having days off, and I was like, yeah, why do we always celebrate Mother's Day on my work day, on a Sunday? Not my only work day, by the way. I know that's a misconception, but... um, and I was totally joking about that. But I think, it's, I think it's, it's funny, interesting, maybe a coincidence, maybe not, that we celebrate these days on Sundays. Because when we gather on Sundays as a church family, we're gathering to honor our Heavenly Father for all the ways that He has provided, comforted, guided, and protected us. Much like our parents do today. God has given an example for us as parents and our parents to do that. And I love the last part of this verse, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God gives you. There's a promise that comes from bringing honor through obedience. That's what Ephesians 6, 2 says. This is the first commandment with a promise. It's promising you that you will have, be long in the land that the Lord your God gives you. Now, we live under the New Testament covenant, and so this is a little bit different because under the New Testament covenant of grace, we have the promise of Jesus' return, and we have a promise of Jesus, of life eternal with Jesus. And so because of that, when it says that your days may be long, that could mean those days may be long here on earth. You might live a long life, but it also means that your days will be long in eternity with Jesus. That's a promise. And so when you honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long, this could mean we are glor- this does mean we are glorifying God through doing that. We honor our father in heaven through obedience in him. And when we are obedient to him, that's when we really become bold. Because in order to be bold, we must have obedience. We spent the last few weeks looking at what it means to live a bold life in Christ. And we've learned about being bold in our speech, bold in our prayers, bold in our community and how we give back to our community. And now we're going to end up with being bold in obedience. But that being bold in obedience, it takes all those things we've already looked at and puts them together. That's what being bold in obedience is. It leads us to being obedient to what God is calling us to. So the definition of obedience is an act or instance of obeying, or it's the quality or state of being obedient. Now, if you've ever been a school teacher, you start the year off praying that you're going to have obedient students. By the time you get to October, those prayers are becoming a little stronger. And by the time you get to now, you're praying bold prayers just for you to be obedient to the state laws. Obedience has various different stages. But what does obedience look like in this context? How can we take examples of obedience in Acts and apply them to our lives today? Well, before Jesus ascended, and we looked at this a few weeks ago, before Jesus ascended back into heaven, in Acts 1.8, look at what he says. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus here is foreshadowing what's going to take place, yet doesn't tell us exactly how it's going to happen. 
He does that a lot, right? He, he says something's going to happen, but doesn't give you all the details because he wants you to figure it out and watch what happens and, and to experience it fully. Because if he tells you exactly how it's going to happen, you're going to wake up and be like, well, is it going to happen today or is it not? And at the end of the day, it didn't happen today. I don't know if Jesus is true. But when Jesus says this is going to happen, just wait and see. You live with expectation. Expectation of a promise fulfilled. And the, the way that this is filled in the book of Acts happens much later. But we're going to look at three people today who acted in obedience that helped carry out this mission that Jesus laid out in Acts 1.8. And we're going to look at Stephen, we're going to look at Philip, and we're going to look at Ananias. Now you're going to say, wait a second, we talked about Ananias last week and he died. Different guy. They didn't have a whole lot of cool names back then that like you just could create a name. Everybody was named the same. And so there's multiple Ananiases in the book of Acts. And the one that we're going to look at today did an amazing thing. Something that many of us would not have the courage to do. So we'll look at that in just a few minutes. The first thing we have to see when we look at these three people, these three acts of obedience, is that we must be, in our, we must be bold in our obedience because we don't know the outcome. It's easy to be courageous when you know what's going to happen. Right? It's easy to be courageous when you know you're going to be safe. Every time I drive to Lano or to Fredericksburg or to Brady, I get scared because I don't know how to drive around deer. Especially when it's dawn or dusk, you know, and they're really active. But I drive it anyways, and to me that's being bold because I'm not used to this. Some of you all have grown up here your whole lives, and you know exactly how to do that. But, but for me... It's a risk that I have to take every time. I don't know the outcome. I don't know if when I turn, go around that curve, if there's going to be a herd of deer standing there. To me, that's being bold in my driving. And when I first moved here, I would drive like 15 miles below the speed limit. And now it's like, whatever happens, happens. We're just going to go. Okay? I'm becoming bolder and bolder in my driving. But we must be bold in our obedience because we don't know the outcome. And the story of Stephen is one of my favorite stories in the entire scripture. Like, I absolutely love this story um, because of what, it, what he does. Here we have a man named Stephen. And if you look back in Act, earlier in Acts, Stephen is chosen in Acts 6 to be one of the first seven to be a deacon. And I talked about deacon nominations a little bit earlier. There were originally seven deacons chosen. The apostles were 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 overseeing the early church and all the administration and everything that went on. And they said, we can do this administration thing really, really well. We can handle this really, really well. But what we're struggling with is because we're so focused on, on running the church and making the church happen, what we're focused on is this. We're starting to not be as good at taking care of those that really need to be cared for, the widows and the orphans and the poor. And so they took this group of seven men and they made them deacons. They made them, they, or, they laid hands on them. They ordained them to be set apart to focus solely on that. And so Stephen was one of those. But as it says in Acts chapter 6, it also says that Stephen was full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And Stephen is the only one here of the seven that this statement is made of, made about. That he is, he is full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. There's something different about Stephen even among those seven. Something special about him. And then in Acts chapter 6, 8, it says that Stephen, who was full in gr of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs. So this man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, again, it's reiterated that he's full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs. So even though Stephen is a deacon to care for the, 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 the widows, to care for the poor, to care for the orphans, there's something even more about him that he is doing ministry and he's doing ministry well. And what do we know about the religious leaders of the day when somebody starts doing ministry well? They don't like that, right? We've seen it all throughout our journey in the past couple of months that the religious leaders do not like when someone is preaching the word. When someone is doing signs and wonders in God's name. It makes them uneasy. It makes them uncomfortable. They just, they, they, they just don't like it. And every time it happens, they react the same way. 
You think one of these days they learned their lesson, right? But they react the same way. And so what do they do with Stephen? Stephen preaches in Acts chapter uh, 6 and 7, and they seize him, and they take him to the high priest to defend himself. And here Stephen does a really good job. And this is a long set of scripture that we're not going to get into today. What I want you to do is go home and read Acts chapter 7. And look at the things that Stephen says in Acts chapter 7. Because he's doing a great job of defending his faith, but also in defending his faith, he's calling out their hypocrisy. He's calling out the hypocrisy of what they're doing. And he uses what some of us might call choice words. Like words that if you're sitting there and you heard him say like, whoa, I can't believe he just said that. Look in Acts chapter 7 verse 51. He says, you stiff-necked people. How would you feel if someone called you stiff-necked? I'd probably start like trying to move my neck around to say, no, I'm not. But he's not meaning like you can't move your neck. He's like, you're rigid. You're too st- stuck in your ways. You're too legalistic. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in your heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Now, Stephen is full of the Holy Spirit, so he knows what it means to embrace the Holy Spirit. And in this embracing of the Holy Spirit, he is being obedient to defend the faith that Jesus has given him. And the leaders did not respond kindly to this. They took him and they stoned him to death. Look at verses 54 to 60. Now when they heard these things, when they heard Stephen call him them stiff-necked and say that you do not, you reject the Holy Spirit, you're just like your dad was, just like your father was. So when they were heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I'm going to stop right here for a second. This is the first mention of what Jesus had said was going to happen. That he was going to go to heaven and be at the right hand of God. Stephen sees it. And it's mentioned here. So we continue on in this passage. In, and he says, but he, full of the Holy Spirit, or, I'm sorry, in verse 57, but they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. We've got a riot about to take place, right? They're going nuts. Then they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Now there's two points that I hope you caught but you might have missed that make this one of my favorite stories in the entire Bible the first point is this in verse 59 Stephen says Lord Jesus receive my spirit have we heard that phrase before we heard that phrase when Jesus was on the cross he said father into your hands I commit my spirit Stephen is being obedient in following Jesus' example and saying, Father, receive my spirit. Take it from me. I give you everything. I'm all in. I give you everything. One of the reasons we as a church believe in baptism by immersion is that it is an act of obedience in following Jesus' example of him being baptized. Jesus was baptized, and if we want to live like Jesus, then therefore we should be baptized just as he was. Stephen is following Jesus' words here of, Father, take my spirit into your hands. I commit my spirit as he's being stoned to death. The time that you're supposed to be most afraid because you don't know what the outcome is going to be on the other side, Stephen says, I'm good. Father, take my spirit. I'm there. Just as, you're, as Jesus did, I do. He's being bold in obedience here. The other thing that I love about this passage is in verse 58. Look who's sitting in verse 58. Saul. And many people gloss over this whole story and never realize that Saul is there. It says a young man named Saul, the witnesses laid down their garments at his feet. Well, Saul, as we're about to see in just a few minutes, becomes Paul. He witnesses this act of obedience that Stephen is having, 
that is doing this act of obedience, he witnesses that. You think that left an impression on him? Well, right off the bat, it leaves an impression on him because it says in, verse, in chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul approved of his execution. Saul was like, cool, kill him. And then there arose a great day, on that day, a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul ravaged the church, and entering house after house, he dragged them off, men and women, and committed them to prison. Sounds pretty bad for the believers, for the Christians in that moment. For what Acts chapter 9 says, the way. The way was a movement. Those that followed Jesus Christ in the early church were part of the way. Stephen's obedience here cost him his life. But in Stephen's death, he had the key to take the gospel out of Jerusalem. Because when Stephen died, when he was executed, that gave them freedom to persecute the church even more. And it scattered the church. Up until this point, the gospel had only been in Jerusalem. And when Stephen was obedient to Jesus, obedient to God, and he gave his life for the message of the gospel, persecution pushed greatly into them, and they scattered out all along Judea and Samaria. Well, what's a Christian going to do? They're going to share the gospel wherever they go. And so it spreads. I was speaking to a friend of mine several years ago, and he told me the story about how the, the people of Cuba... The believers that live in Cuba joke that Fidel Castro is the greatest church planner of all time. That's probably the most oxymoronic statement you'll ever hear me say, right? This guy, this communist is the greatest church planner in the history of all time? Listen to this. When Fidel Castro took power in Cuba and he made communism the government of Cuba, He said, no more new churches. No more new churches. But he put a a caveat on it. No more churches over 30 people. You could start a church, but it could never grow over 30 people. Because that's going to be him hindering the spread of the gospel. So they started these little house churches. And this house church would grow to 30 people. And they say, we can't grow anymore because we're going to get in trouble with the government. But nothing says we can't go two houses down and start another one. And so they would train up a leader to go and pastor a church two houses down. 30 more people. And then they'd do it again. And then they'd do it again. And so over the course of Castro's life, all of these 30-member house churches started. And now, we know that Cuba is a small country, right? Right? It is estimated, estimated that they have over 10,000 trained pastors in Cuba. All because Castro said you can't have a church over 30 people. Persecution in the church causes the gospel to spread like a wildfire. And we're seeing it all over the world right now as the church is persecuted more and more across the world. The gospel is spreading more and more, particularly in the Muslim countries. Stephen's. The persecution of Stephen, his martyrdom, and then the persecution of the church immediately after that spread the gospel out of Jerusalem and into Judea and Samaria. And this is where we pick up the story of Philip. Philip's obedience spread the gospel beyond Jerusalem and into Samaria. Philip was also a deacon chosen to serve, one of those original seven, and he was to oversee the distribution of the poor. But he's also one of the first Christians to preach the gospel outside of Jerusalem. Because of Stephen's martyrdom, this persecution raged, raged and they were scattered. And so when Peter, Phil, or, excuse me, Philip ends up in Samaria, he begins to preach the gospel, and he too begins to perform signs and wonders. The same thing that Stephen was doing, Philip is now doing so. 
And in Acts chapter 8, verse 4 and 5, it says, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed them to the Christ. And, then it ain't, <clears throat> and so he's preaching to them. As so many people are becoming converted, so many people are be- beginning to believe and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that it makes an impact. And Peter and John actually go to Samaria to pray for those people. And so as this is going on, and Philip has continued, then in verse 26, it says, An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south of the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And as he got there, there was an Ethiopian, an Ethiopian eunuch, who was a court official to Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. He was in charge of all of her treasure. And it says there in verse 27, He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and as he was returning... He was in his chariot, and he was reading the scriptures from the prophet Isaiah. Philip comes running alongside the chariot. And something about Philip tells this Ethiopian to ask him questions, to ask him to basically interpret what's happening in Isaiah. So Philip does, and then in verse 39, verse 38, the eunuch says, why can't I be baptized right now? And so they get out of the chariot. Philip takes them down to the river and baptizes them. And in verse 39 it says, When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. So basically, Philip baptizes him. He comes up and Philip disappears. Be like John just poof, gone this morning. To another location says that Philip was taken to Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. When you're obedient to the call, you don't know where it's going to take you. Philip started in Jerusalem. He ended up in Samaria. Then he ended up sharing the gospel with an Ethiopian, so I, and it says the man went away rejoicing. So he went to Ethiopia, and you know he shared it with everybody that, that came in, he came in contact with. And then he ends up preaching the gospel between Azotus and Caesarea, you know, all the towns. He's living on mission. He's being obedient and living on mission. So Stephen's decision to be obedient was the key to taking the gospel out of Jerusalem. Philip, being obedient, took the gospel to Samaria and beyond. And then we get to Ananias. And Ananias' obedience fulfills the last part of Acts 1.8. And that sends the gospel to the ends of the earth. The beginning of Acts chapter 9, we see Saul on his way to Damascus to go and persecute more Christians. And along the way, along that road to Damascus, Saul encounters an experience with Jesus Christ. And in that, he discovers who Jesus is. He becomes a believer. And it says that he is blinded. And he cannot see. And in verse 10, it says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And look at Ananias' response. Here I am, Lord. How many times when you feel like God is telling you to do something, your first response is, here I am, Lord. For me, when God tells me to do something, I'm like, are you sure? I don't say, here I am, Lord. Ananias doesn't even know what God's about to ask him. He just says, he just hears his name, Ananias, and he says, whatever you got, Lord, I'm here. The Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Now, this is where Ananias begins to question it because now there's names put to the thing. And Ananias knows who Saul is. He knows Saul's reputation. And he says, but Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. So Saul has been given authority from the chief priest to do whatever it takes to squash the gospel. Ananias doesn't know what has taken place on the road to Damascus. He just knows what he's heard about Saul. The Lord says in verse 15, Go, 
For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. The Lord's command to Ananias is go. And then he gives him comfort. And Ananias says in verse 17, So Ananias departed and he entered the house. And he laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and he was baptized. Ananias' call was not to be the one that brought Paul to Jesus. That happened through a personal interaction with Jesus Christ. Just like you and I cannot lead someone to Christ. That's a call that comes from God to them that they accept. You and I are the messengers of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then Ananias' responsibility was to say, Paul, Saul, God has something much, much greater in store for your life. I'm going to affirm what God is doing in your life, and I'm going to ordain you to go into ministry. We're going to go get baptized, and then you are going to change the world. Because Ananias' obedience sent the gospel to the ends of the earth. He could have said, no, I'm not going. I might lose my life. He said, no, God, I'm going to go. I'm going to do what you told me to do. And the gospel went to the ends of the earth. Because bold obedience obedience leads us to unimaginable places never thought reachable. And it leads us to people that we never thought we would reach. And to hearts that we thought were hardened beyond repair. I want to end with a story today to show you just how you being obedient, you don't know what impact is going to happen down the road. You might have heard this story before. 1858 in the city of Boston, Edward Kimball was a young Sunday school teacher who made it a habit to personally give each student in his class an opportunity to accept Christ as their Savior. He was concerned about one of his students who worked in a shoe store. One day, Kimball visited the young man at the store where he found in the back stocking shelves and he led him to Christ. That student was Dwight L. Moody, who eventually left the shoe business to become one of the greatest evangelists of all time. Moody became an international speaker and toured the British Isles. He preached in a little chapel pastored by a young man named Frederick Meyer. And in his sermon, he told the story of his Sunday school teacher about this man who had made a point to go personally share the gospel with Dwight Moody. That message changed Pastor Meyer's ministry, inspiring him to become an evangelist like Moody. Meyer eventually preached in America in Northfield, Massachusetts, where a young preacher heard him say, If you are not willing to give up everything for Christ, are you willing to be made willing? That remark led J. Wilbur Chapman to respond to God's call on his life. Wilbur Chapman went on to become an effective evangelist, and he enlisted the help of a professional ball player named Billy Sunday, who helped him set up for his crusades. Billy Sunday learned how to preach by watching Chapman and eventually took over Chapman's ministry, becoming a dynamic evangelist. Billy Sunday's preaching brought thousands to Christ. Inspired by a Billy Sunday crusade in Charlotte, North Carolina, a group of Christian men dedicated themselves to reaching their city for Christ. They invited an evangelist named Mordecai Ham to come and hold a series of evangelistic meetings. 1932, A local farmer loaded his pickup truck with neighbors and brought them to the meetings. One was a 16-year-old boy who sat in the crowd each night spellbound by the message. Each evening, the preacher seemed to be shouting and waving his finger right at the young man. Night after night, the teenager, teenager came, and finally on the last night, he went forward and gave his life to Christ. That teenager's name was Billy Graham. Billy Graham has communicated the gospel to more people than any other person in history. You probably have met or are someone who was led to Christ through Billy Graham's ministry or some part of Billy Graham's ministry. 
And it all started with a Sunday school teacher named Edward Kimball who cared for the souls of his students to personally make sure they knew and understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we are bold in the obedience to the call that God has placed on our lives, and your call is different than my call, and your call is different than the person next to you, but if we are boldly obedient in that call that God has given us, you don't know what's going to happen. Stephen didn't realize that when he boldly defended his faith to death, that the gospel was going to leave Jerusalem. Philip saw that he had been scattered through the persecution, but the gospel meant so much to him, he was going to continue to preach it in Samaria. And in Samaria, many people became, became believers. And then he got the opportunity to preach it to an Ethiopian, to take the gospel to Ethiopia without him ever having to step foot in Ethiopia. And then Ananias was to go and to lay hands and pray for Saul so that when Saul his eyes were opened, the world was changed. Edward Kimball shared the gospel with Dwight Moody, and several generations later, Billy Graham came and changed the world. Jesus changes all of us, and Jesus gives us a call on our lives, and we must be boldly obedient to that. If we want to see the world changed, if we want to see revival, if we want to see Christ and God's name made known, we have to be boldly obedient. But if you don't have a relationship with him, you don't know what that means. This all seems kind of weird to us, or to you, excuse me. And I'd love to visit with you and share more with you about that, and I'll be down here, for, or I'll be in the back at the end of the service. Um, but if you also want to make this your church home, we're going to have a time for that. But I just want you to take some time. John and the band are going to come up and, and play. And I want you to take time to think about what is God calling me to do that I need to be boldly obedient in. Some of you, it's to have a conversation with someone. Some of you, it's to repair a relationship. Some of you, it's to take that step and to go on a mission trip around the world to share the gospel. I don't know what your call is. But God does. So I want you to take some time praying for that. God, show me my call and show me how to be obedient in that call, much like Stephen, Philip, and Ananias. Let's pray.